Members, we might get started. Uh, so thank you members uh, for the opening of the special meeting of Tuesday the 6th of July. Um, I advise that the special meeting of council will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio visual recording has been taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or publicised published publicly by the council including transfer outside of Australia. Item one on the agenda is acknowledgement to country. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. And uh, I hope everybody gets to enjoy NAIDOC week this week. Um, item two on the agenda is the acknowledgement to Colonel William Light. The council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Uh, members, we have several apologies and leaves of absence tonight. We have Councillor Martin on leave. Uh, Councillor Abraham today, Councillor Kerra and Councillor Moran has also given her apologies for this meeting. Uh, members, we have one item on the agenda tonight, which is the representation review process considerations. For your consideration. So, I will ask for a mover. Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to move the second one. Process two. Process two. And do you have a seconder? Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. So, Councillor Hyde, would you split my speech to it? Um, only to thank the administration and um, our consultants on this for their um, uh, ongoing efforts. It's not an easy exercise um, to withdraw in the city where we have many, uh, to draw boundaries and, and do a representation within the city where we have many diverse communities. Um, uh, the reason that I think uh, process two is um, the preferred option at this point is because we had obviously a number of um, uh, very different options thrown up and looking at the consultation results, no single option was actually the standout um, for the community. Yes, option two was you know a, a couple of percent above um, uh, one of the other options and they're all about the same level. Um, now going going into this process, I um, predicted that the community by and large would want to keep wards because they like having a local member as it were. Um, uh, but I know, and I know colleagues here know that area councillors play a really important role in the city of Adelaide. Um, uh, and and as a one as a capital city, it's important to have them bringing a citywide perspective to decision making. Um, but almost in a, you know, to make comparisons to other levels of government, it's almost like having, you know, a lower house and an upper house. The the upper house represents the entirety of the electorate, and they make decisions for the entirety of the electorate. Um, and I think that area play there there is a there are a similar role that area councillors can play in that regard. Um, uh, so option two doesn't really appeal to me um, because if you were to pick area councillors, you would have only what, a maximum of three, I think, from memory. So when um, you're talking about option two, you're talking about option two in Sorry, option, option, one, option, option two, two in option paper one, one yeah. referred to in process one. I'm sort of saying why I'm picking process two over process one, but um, uh, that option doesn't appeal to me because it's important to have a plurality of views. And if you're going any, like, to be honest, any less than four area councillors, I feel is almost a pointless exercise. Three, maybe you can get away with it, but two, one, you might as well not do it. Um, and so I think that dilutes the meaning because uh, you want to have that plurality of views in that, in that role. Um, uh, in particular, I think that's what is valuable to the community because there is, um, you know, even if you don't like your board councillors, there is an area councillor for everyone. 
Um, and I think that's a really important thing so that constituent ratepayers and residents know there's someone that they feel comfortable going to as well. So um, that's why at this stage, uh, given the timelines um, uh, do match up, there's not much room to breathe in there, but I have absolute faith in our administration that they can get the consultation done, done properly, come back um, with the results of that, and then we can select something to go to the second lot of consultation. I think above all else, the electoral commissioner will look at the process um, uh, uh, and they will look at was the process conducted well? We just have 30 more seconds. Members, um, it's me. Was the process conducted well? Sorry, I actually do need some hands. Thank you very much. Did it, did it, did it go out to the community? Was there feedback given? And then was it taken on board? Um, this actually gives us an extra six weeks of feedback um, uh, to collect based on some further refined options. Um, uh, and I think there's a better chance that we'll have an option here that preserves area councillors. Um, that's why I think we should go with process two at this point and um, look at the consider the community's feedback in the six weeks' time. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Did you wish to speak? Right. Members? Councillor Mackey? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, a question uh, of you, if I might. Um, you, you occupy a very important leadership on the council, and I think that the elected members here would benefit from uh, hearing your uh, on balance uh, thoughts on the model going forward. <laughs> I'm very happy to give my comments, but I will wait for other members to speak if they wish to. Councillor Dunn. I'm happy personally with the uh, option as proposed, so I will vote against process two. Uh, I think it goes to a second round of consultation, so we get another 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 bite at the cherry if people want to provide further uh, feedback and spending another twenty thousand dollars on something that's likely to come up with more options that, as the risks uh, suggest, will, if anything, potentially dilute the feedback. Um, I think personally, just proceeding as suggested uh, makes a lot of sense. Members, Councillor I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy for uh, uh, option two simply because um, when we're looking at the at the way the Adelaide is growing and uh, you know how how we're trying to give the maximum length of time uh, for each and before we need to do another another review, um, this speaks to that, whereas the others haven't to this point. And it's, it is, a, if we look at here, uh, if we do not grow at the, uh, at the rate at which, uh, you know, it's predicted here, then we could potentially last out for, for say, four elections um, rather than just three. Whereas if we, can, if we don't ask those questions now, in, after this second election, uh, we will be having to ask that question again. So in other words, because it, uh, we fall out of that 10% either way, this talks about it, the very, uh, uh, you know, say the third option here is, is just as a, as a conversation piece, is that it gives you 10% either way. Um, you know, so that if, if the growth of, of central doesn't uh, eventuate, then we should, could, be, uh, could come out of this with, um, you know, a fourth election that uh, will stay within, uh, within the bounds, which means that uh, we won't have to uh, do a redistribution that early, whereas if we if we stick with the options that we've been given now, uh, after two uh, two election rounds, we will have to revisit this and spend that same amount of money again. And so it just gives people another option to have a look at it because uh, what they're getting at is that you are going to have to do something like, uh, say, the option three is just as a conversation piece. You have to do that anyway, simply because of the way the city is growing. So they're going to there's going to be change, whether it's now or in, a, in within a short period going forward. So it's nice to have a conversation with with the electors around that to see, okay, this is what's going to happen whether you decide now or whether it will be later, and it, at least it puts it in their minds that this is this is going to be an eventuation of some form, simply because we don't have a choice. Um, and, and they also want it in their line with, they want to have less councillors uh, um, as well. So how do you, uh, uh, you know, reapportion that so that you fulfill that wish for less councillors with uh, trying to be e even and equal with representation? And it's very difficult in, a, in a, 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 the city of Adelaide where the, the development is so, uh, you know, out of, out of whack, it's, there's no balance. So how do we do that better for the community? while retaining the value of their vote and, and their representation. And you, you want to be able to have that the duality between a ward councillor and, and an area councillor. Why? Because 
One is about fighting for me and my space, and the other is about fighting for the city as a whole. And that gives options for people with, with two different uh, view, you know, two different uh, ways to be elected, so that you're able to get a little bit more uh, balance, but also have that very specific person that is here to fight on my behalf. Thank you, Councillor Noll. Um, Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, firstly, through you, a question uh, to the administration. In years past, and I, I have raised this at a, at a previous briefing, um, is it fair to say that the removal of wards and a move, and were we to move a return to all area, that that eliminates the need for this balancing of number of members per ward, etc., etc. That's the question I'll uh, Actually, it. it's in the paper. So yeah. in um, process number two, option number one, which is the no wards, um, uh, does actually answer that question, um, Councillor. And then the choice for us will be the number, so Lord Mayor plus, yeah. um, and uh, which would be, uh, I would suggest either nine or seven. So, um, so it does remove all of that because of the quotas. So, um, thanks, sorry. thanks, Lord Mayor. Thank I appreciate that yep. um, uh, reminder of what's in the paper. Um, if I might, therefore, speak to yep. the motion. Um, I will support option two because it does afford a further opportunity for consideration of including the option uh, to abandon wards and return to all area elected members, having served in a council where that occurred, I can absolutely guarantee it did not skew the composition of the body uh, in the favour of one group or another. It was about the calibre of the candidates and it was about the um, their ability to harness and motivate people to vote. Let's not forget that less than one in five people on average who have a vote bother to vote. Um, the far greater way of ensuring greater, more, more equitable, more, more representative um, uh, governance uh, is in fact for more people to be motivated to vote. And it strikes me that in a model where all candidates are reaching out to all voters, A, it, it tempers the tendency toward uh, sectionalism or parochialism, and that's, as we all know, not only a factor of uh, geography. It is a factor of, of activity type or interest uh, in the city. And um, I, I, I know and I acknowledge that the public consultation and the 88 responses or thereabouts that, that it elicited um, uh, advocate uh, for uh, wards and that the precinct groups advocate for wards. But it occurs to me that we have an opportunity to provide some more education about what the practical real life experience. We are a tiny jurisdiction in the scheme of things. We're blessed to be a tiny jurisdiction and a capital city. Um, uh, we, are, we're, we are currently overrepresented uh, relative to other places in Australia, certainly even other places in Greater Adelaide. Um, and um, my experience was that um, a, a lesser number of councillors who were all area actually did produce a better caliber of awareness and, and a better set of accountabilities between elected members and the, and the broader community. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I understand um, the point in regards to having area councillor. My only concern, and I've always said it before, is that if it was compulsory voting, I feel that there would be a better balance of elected members under that um, scheme of having just area councillors. Um, I think the reason why ward is much preferred is that they feel, um, the public generally feel, and it was present in the consultation, that um, they have someone that they can connect with in regards to their area. Um, I think also, um, you know, we need to look at the fact that we need to take this a step further in regards to making sure that we um, have got the balance right and that, you know, it's inevitable that, as Councillor Canole said, that we may have to split one day North Adelaide 
date and it might be a conversation that we might need to have now or it might be something that we're having later but it needs to be a conversation that we need to have in depth with our um, constituents of their ratepayers. So the fact that we've taken this out there again allows that conversation to happen again um, and really um, draw on it much deeper. I think that we need to actually look at um, also the broader issue on how um, our business community can vote much easier in the elections. It's complicated for them and we need to revise that. But overall, taking it back out there um, with only 89 responses that received from the consultation um, and uh, you know getting another perspective is uh, a good idea. Thank you. Um, members, um, just a, a few comments. I, I don't believe we're the only council going back out to consultation with acting CEO. So, um, and we are. Um, we have checked in with administration to make sure that we can deliver. There may be some special council meetings required just for a timing perspective. Um, I think it was fairly clear in the first round of consultation that an overall re uh, reduction in uh, numbers in terms of representation was supported. Um, I think, Councillor Mackey, that the last election was about a 33 or 34% voter turnout, so one in three. And yes, we still need to do more to get more people to vote. Uh, we obviously did support in the LGA reform uh, compulsory voting. Um, unfortunately, uh, and, and particularly for the City of Adelaide as pot a, a potential pilot area, um, I do think that uh, there's still um, a way to go with that one. Um, the responses, uh, again, I, I queried today, the very low responses, 89 responses for rep review just seems to um, be incredibly low, but apparently it's comparative and compared to some of the other councils, we had an extraordinary high uh, <laughs> turnout and response. Um, so I do I do find that amazing. Um, look, I do also support process number two, going back out for consultation, um, mainly because I would like to get a feedback uh, against three. I also look at um, having been an area councillor, looking at there being area councillors, looking at three wards, which we would then choose as a council, how many area councillors we would put with those three. But that pretty much means um, that we would go back to a council of 12, so therefore not reducing numbers if we would have area councillors as well. Um, and in the, um, the adapted three wards option, um, there, does, there is an opportunity for five uh, ward councillors plus for area councillors and the Lord Mayor, which still bring a reduction of numbers to 10. So I think in terms of the numbers and looking at the quotas, um, that one is worth us going out for consultation and getting some feedback on. So I, I thank the members for their work and I, I thank um, the team, um, Amanda, Jess, uh, Mick, and also Holmes Dyer for the work on that and um, commend it to the Chamber. So I'll go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. And just reiterating what what sort of process two is, um, my my read of it, and you know there are multiple ways that you can you can throw the councils around, but um, you've got option one, which is area, all area. You've got option two, which even though you can have a couple of area with it, really you are just the the way to do it would be wards only and no area. Um, because a couple of areas just doesn't really make sense. And then option three explores the possibility of keeping area and wards, um, but it confronts the reality, which is that if you're going to have a reduction in councillors, if you're going to keep as best as possible the wards you have now, if you're going to keep area councillors, um, uh, you are have to, going to have to touch the North Adelaide boundary because if you don't touch the North Adelaide boundary and you still want to keep it in, in tolerance, you need to put more ward councillors into the CBD part of the city. You do that too much and you push area councillors out entirely because you've got that cap. But really, we should be going for a reduction. I think that was very clear in the consultation at least. Um, that's how I see it. I see it as three options, one for area entirely, um, one for wards only, um, and, and, and one which confronts the reality that where you have two areas where there's a substantial disparity in the population growth, you're going to need to move that boundary. Um, uh, and that's that's what process two delivers. 
Um, I certainly take Councillor Mackey's um, uh, points around having more people going out um, is better. I'm just trying to balance that against um, balance that against what what they actually want. They do want to keep their ward councillor, but I, it's a completely legitimate perspective that um, uh, that that area is necessary. And I'll be very very interested to see um, what the consultation comes back with on what I think are three very clear very clear options. And if anything, this process this process adds to the overall consultation and then we can hand and heart go to the commissioner and say, look, um, uh, we absolutely explored everything um, and we took on the community's feedback at every point in our various processes throughout this. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. That's it. Um, thank you, members. We will have a five-minute break before we go to the I call the meeting closed. Thank you.
I advise at the meeting of the committee we stream live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will be also be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, published publicly by the Council, including transparent outside Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect the cultural heritage beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge they are of continual importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend the respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Apologies and leave uh, absence. We have Councillor Martin and Councillor uh, Abraham today and Councillor Kira. I now seek a mover and a seconder to move the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 15th of June uh, 2021 be taken read and be confirmed as an accurate recording of the proceedings. Do I have a mover? Councillor Canal, do I have a seconder? Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor O. Would you like to speak to it, Councillor? <coughs> Anyone else would like to speak to it? No? I will take this to a vote. Those in favour? Those against? Motion is carried. Thank you. Members, we're going straight to the first item um, on the agenda, which is 5.1, which the Bundy's Paddock uh, Tidalianka, I hope I said that right, Park Nine. Um, we have Christy with us. Christy, no? Lauren, I've got Christy. Oh, okay. We're all here. Oh, we're all here? Oh, everyone, everyone. I'm just going by what's on my paper. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, Tom, you would like to speak to that? We have discussed this at length, sorry. Um, there, this is a noting of the uh, consultation. So does anyone have any questions in regards to the consultation? No? Yes? Oh, uh, thanks, Chair. I'm only to acknowledge with some appreciation the, the fact that the, pro the proposal has been responsive to legitimate, genuine concerns of the community uh, and taken it into account. And I, I absolutely commend the report, uh, which which gives a very good and balanced airing uh, of those. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor um, Hyde? Um, just obviously members would be um, familiar with uh, the APLA and the presentation there and the deputation there. I was hoping the administration could just um, outlined that at Appler it was said that there was a discrepancy between the lease and the CLMP. Um, I just want the administration to clarify that. I, I disagree, but it's something that's that's come up, and so I think members would benefit from the explanation from the administration there, particularly regarding the service of alcohol and timing. Tom? Through your society member, there, there is no discrepancy between the lease and the CLMP. What's before you tonight talks to a 21 year lease, which will be presented to the Minister of Home. But in effect, the lease actually has it in two parts. It talks to a 10 year term being the first term and a 11 year term being the second year term or second term being 21. The reasons for that are quite simple. It's quite uh, the capital investment required by the proponent. Uh, similar to other leases we've done in parklands, we believe can be recovered within the first 10 years. However, if the proponent was to cause a breach and they were to be removed from the premises, that ten, first 10 years means that we need to compensate and uh, pay off the costs. However, when it hits to year 11, there's no cost to council. It's a simple le lease arrangement which talks to uh, capital recovery and 21 years to split into two parts. Sorry, I was also talking about the service of alcohol and the and the hours. So the service of alcohol Saturday. with the CLMP, it talks to a Saturday and it talks from 12 to 6. Um, and that's consistent and that's also respectful of the feedback that we got through the community consultation. Um, but just it was it was said it was said that I'm oh, sorry, I know that I know that Tom wasn't here, I think that week. It was it was it was said in the deputation to Apple that it doesn't match up. My read of it is that it does match up and it makes sense. Is that the administration's view as well? I guess it is. Um, seeing as you mentioned the lease, though, through your chair, 
Um, is the, the, at any point in the discussions with PAOC, was, was a departing from the original proposal for a 21 year lease, um, was that discussed with them prior to this being drafted and brought into APRA and now us here? Through society member, quite simply, PAC wanted a 21 year lease. However, looking at the lease agreement, uh, and we have discussed this with PAC and they have varying views. However, looking at a responsible lease and looking at what we've done with other leaseholders within the parklands, we have invested significant capital. We've actually structured it, as I've indicated, 10 years being the first term where they have the ability to recover their capital, and then actually the second term, noting it's at the discretion of the leasee. So it still is a 21 year lease. The only way they would be in the lease effectively is if they're in breach. That answers your question, Councillor Moran? Yep. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, yeah, so can I just have a fleshed out um, point nine? Um, it says the PAC, they have, they have indicated they do not support the details of the liquor licence arrangement in the lease agreement. Mm -hmm. What do they want? Uh, Tom? Yep. <laughs> Indication from PAC is they want to have it reflected within the CLMP where it doesn't talk to a specific time, but it talks to a more generic uh, or lease agreement which it says at the discretion of council where it be presented back to council. Um, however, we, we've took on board the consultation from the community and placed that within the CLMP. So that's hard and fast. Mm -hmm. Correct. It is well done. Look, and um, any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at item 5.2, home buyers rate um, home buyers rate remission scheme. Michelle I will be um, here to answer any questions that you have. In regards, so it is a new scheme. Well, we've done something like this in the past, but um, do you want to just recap on a few things, or Michelle? Thank you, um, Deputy Lord Mayor. I thought I'd maybe just introduce it. It was nice to have some positive media on this today. Um, so, um, in light of the need for more affordable housing um, in the city and a contribution made to the city's um, economy and also social fabric of the city from key city workers, um, council requested that we develop a framework and an eligibility criteria for a five year um, rate free period to attract city workers to live in the city. Um, that scheme has been prepared based on those instructions from Council. Um, we've prepared operating guidelines to support its implementation. And importantly, it's also considered the outcomes of the scheme that ran from the 1st of July 2017 through to the 30th of June 2019. Um, the scheme is subject to um, the state government committing to complementary incentives such as stamp um, duty concessions, um, and that's um, that was council's decision. Um, if approved, a formal request, approved next week, I should say, a formal request will be made to the state government um, seeking support prior to the implementation of the scheme. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I've been given to understand that uh, there is a body of work, a substantial body of work that AIDA have embarked upon in relation to um, residential incentive and growth and that this paper in today's agenda foreshadowing next week agenda has somewhat taken them by surprise. I'd be grateful for a comment um, from the administration. See ya. Uh, thank you through the presiding member. Um, AIDA um, does have um, a strategic plan and business plan objective around residential growth. Um, I understand the board recently has signed off a nine point plan to investigate various different ways in which to drive that over the coming years. Um, policy, uh, members will remember when um, AIDA was established, um, policy remains um, with the City of Adelaide. Um, and program and project delivery sits with AIDA. Um, this piece of body of work is policy driving 
um, and so hence why it's come through the arm of the City of Adelaide. Um, in terms of um, visibility at the board level, um, I have a catch up with the chair next week and I'll certainly be able to have a, a conversation about how we make sure um, pieces of work um, have the visibility that the board feels it needs to have um, and making sure that there's clarity around roles and responsibility. Any other questions? Councillor Hyde. Um, thanks, Deputy Lord Mayor. I'm just curious as to how the list at 10 was devised um, and, and whether reading reading that list, how does it how does it then carry through into the operating um, uh, guidelines? So how do we work out who is a key city worker and who isn't, I suppose? Um, and then how does that carry through to the, the actual operation of what the public grant would operate? Um, yes, through the uh, chair. Uh, so um, you know in paragraph uh, 10 we talk about key city workers being more than essential workers. Um, council uh, had uh, it was council's decision to not just have a means testing, um, which is what we've also incorporated in there around low and uh, medium uh, income earners, but for it to be targeting key city workers. So we have looked um, at um, a, a variety of definitions around the country uh, in terms of key city workers, and we've tried to keep ours as broad as possible. Of course, it is up to council as to whether they want to um, broaden that definition, they want to contain that definition, or whether they actually just want it to be means tested. I'll just, Abby, did you want to add anything more to that? Uh, no, that was the point that that was there. There was no single definition existing, so we actually did some research to come up with the list. And, and, and reading the guidelines, so um, if someone is a bus, and, a, and this, this is just the, when you start getting too prescriptive, I think this is part of the risk, like we've got bus and, 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 and rail drivers in there, um, but we've missed sort of taxi drivers, for example. Um, now I assume bus and rail drivers in there because people are coming to and from the city and they're key to the city's operation, but obviously there's lots of taxis in the city and they're key to getting around the city as well. Um, and this, my, my problem is when we get too prescriptive is um, we haven't put in the, the juices as they're called for the e-scooters um, and they're now considered part of the transport option in the city as well. So I just, um, and, the, and the way, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Chair, the way I'm reading it is that unless you are a key city worker, you can't qualify for it because that, I would think it's almost that item one in the eligibility criteria. Um, so I'm just, uh, so obviously the option has been said that you could, we could, we could resolve just to disregard the key city worker aspect and just um, means test it. Um, are there any other ways that we could try and broaden the definition? Are there, would it be better to adhere to some principles relating to employment? And also furthermore on the topic, um, how would we, how would, how are people going to prove that they're working um, uh, in those industries as well? I'm mean, just, what, what is the onus of proof? Because everyone's employment arrangements can be different and or flexible. They might have more than one job as well. Um, what's, how do we see it working in practice? Thanks, Michelle. Um, through the chair. So we have um, pondered upon, upon these same complex questions ourselves um, and that's why we've tried to go as broadly as possible um, by looking at existing definitions around key city workers and also bringing in um, the requirement around um, income and means testing because you could say healthcare or key city work might be a surgeon but really are we wanting to be providing um, you know, rate rebates for surgeons. So um, this this is absolutely a really key um, element of the policy. Um, and we could be as broad as possible, but if you're going to be as broad as possible, then it, it does bring in the question about whether you actually even should 
um, contain it to key city workers? Um, and do we, are we, you know, are we actually happy for people to come and live in the city and work in Marlin as well? So um, we're really interested in hearing what council's got to say about this. And, and we certainly would be open to not having a definition and a requirement for you to be a key city worker, but that are more around the, perhaps the promotion of a, a rate rebate. Mm -hmm. Just on the touching on the you know buying in the city but actually working in my lend or what have you obviously there's a little bit of modeling that's been done around how much people might spend um, and I know there's, there's no easy answer to that saying they might spend somewhere between 750 and two million dollars a year we don't know necessarily um, but did, did we model did we model if someone is living in the city and actually working, outside the city and then how much they contribute because I live in the city and I work outside the city but the vast majority of my funds are expended here in the city so how does someone who lives here but works outside compare to someone who lives here and works here so through the chair so through the chair um, we don't have the nuance around that so you can see through the assumptions that have been made um, in the attachment that it's really around I think that 50% of local spend um, of people's disposable income so of course that is going to change how much disposable income they've got so we don't have that type of nuance but we're looking around that 50%. <laughs> I'm just going to ask members if um, during the meeting if we can refrain from talking to each other just because it's a little bit distracting for administration. Um, I see your hand, Councillor Moran, but I had Councillor Canole first. Thank you. Um, just as a, the first question is uh, obviously this, we've done something similar before. Uh, has that demonstrated in that previous uh, 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 you know, rate free um, uh, that there was an uplift? in the actual numbers of, of people uh, buying in the city. So, because I mean, I'm sorry, I, I did look at it, but I, I, I don't know how that uh, number. Um, yeah, through the chair. So um, if you look at um, link three, which is the review of that um, free rates of five years previous um, um, incentive, um, it, um, there's an inference that it definitely did um, increase and certainly when it increased the uptake and, and the interest um, and certainly in that low to middle income under $600,000 um, bracket, um, both um, I think it was 57% um, of all uptake was in that, that particular bracket and then the qualitative um, information we've heard from real estate agents and, and that type of feedback was that at that price point it really does make a difference um, and when we looked at the, the, the data that came back those people who are more price sensitive it did make a difference to them. I can't actually then say it was 20% or 50% that it, you know, it changed uh, their behaviour but um, all intents and, and purposes there was a there was a difference but we have to also remember at the same time there was also additional incentives from the state government um, as well that would have played into that and was it also um you know taking into account any change in interest rates because i've been trying to think back where interest rates have collapsed and if that was sort of packed into this conversation as well because if that is a significant factor then it would have negated a little bit more of the other so through, through through the chair, um, so there's no, been no analysis in relation to what the impact of interest rates um, were at the time or what they have been now. Obviously, historic, we're, you know, we're at historically low levels, um, but we're also seeing increasing um, prices right across the country uh, in, in, in all sorts of um, products in the market. So um, we don't have any data specifically on, on the impact of existing price point or on the um, impact on um, purchases because of very low interest rates. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the, so if we talk about this, and this we've already talked about uh, a price point, is there a, a um, you know, what does a typical $600,000 or whatever sort of a, a, a place look like um, when we're trying to attract, say, families and things like that. So uh, what are they, in, was there a, a view of that? Because obviously that's part of the promotion to say, well, this is, this is the sort of uh, accommodation that someone can, can purchase. Um, and, uh, you know, is that something that the average person in, in Adelaide would think, yes, that's acceptable and uh, we could talk to that? Or is it just, just the actual monetary? 
measures. So, if you're talking about under, sorry, through the chair, if you're talking about under 600,000, um, obviously the size of the apartment that you're um, getting is, is smaller. When we looked at our last um, lot, I think it was 25% of respondents were um, first home buyers. Um, so, you know, entering the market for the first time, um, our um, modelling has a number of 1.6 persons per household. So I would expect you're more likely to get a two bedroom house um, or apartment, I should say, for that price point. Once you're looking at three bedrooms or more, you're pushing up. But Tom might be able to answer that more in more detail given his experience with ADA O'Connell. Through you, presiding member, just to keep it quick, the average uh, apartment price in the uh, city of Ireland is four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. That's typically around a single bed. Um, so Michelle's indeed correct. Once you start to go extra bedrooms, but still within that six hundred thousand threshold or whatever. But once you start to get the three, we're looking at bigger living rooms. That's when the costs start to creep up. But the intent of this is actually to get you know, essential workers, more people into the city, and we're not targeting the high end in regards to the treatment. Yeah, I was just so I was just looking at this as in families and things like that, who obviously um, would be not encouraged, but it's just it would be something that wouldn't be suitable for them. So we are just talking about couples at best who um, you know whose incomes. You know, aren't, aren't too uh, out of whack with being able to easily afford it rather than trying to support those. Okay. Councillor Moran? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm all for um, encouraging to buy in city, but this smacks a little bit of, with the list of people of uh, social engineering to me. Um, what, how do you stop wealthy parents with a hospitality worker or um, funding this? How do you stop the bank of mum and dad with a lowly paid child um, buying it? I know last time we did that, that was pretty much everybody that bought it. It did not, it did not get the, um, the people that it, you were aiming for. And I don't really care whether it did or not, but if you're a... How do you stop that if you want to stop it? Because that is who we buy. Um, so through the chair, um, we when you look at link five, which has the um, uh, well, a couple of the links, including link five, have the criteria. So um, you have to satisfy the income and asset um, test criteria. So you're actually linking that to a contract. So who is on the contract for the property? So um, unless possibly a, a parents could purchase a, an apartment in somebody else's name, but we would be looking at whose name is the contract in and what is their um, income the and asset. The child. It name would be in one of these people's thing, but I, if I had a son who's a brewster and I wanted to buy him a place, mm -hmm. I, I could buy it, couldn't I? Correct. Yeah. 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 So, so through the chair, that's the point. Allowing rich people to buy their children houses in the city. Is that really what you want? <laughs> I mean, I'm the guy, I don't buy my kids one, but um, I don't think that's what you mean. Um, no. uh, CEO, yeah. did you want to add something to that? I could see that you've got your... No? No? Well, just the, the bank of mum and dad is alive and well in Australia yeah. across, across yeah. the nation, so um, how that's funded is obviously generational at the moment, Councillor Murray. I know, but what you're doing is allowing... You, you're trying to social engineer, and that's a worthy thing, that people that otherwise couldn't have afforded to move in the city. Now, this this gives an easy entree. These will be sold again uh, at quite a large profit. Now, if I was a super wealthy people with multiple children that couldn't afford to live in the city, I'd be buying every single one of them and selling them in 10 years' time with a massive profit. Yeah. And I know that happened last time. So, yeah. what, what are you doing? Um, so, through the chair, um, so you'll see the criteria doesn't extend to um, the rate um, rebate post sale. Um, so the, that next purchaser wouldn't um, be able to access the, the rate um, rebate. Um, but you're correct. It is possible that somebody could buy an apartment for their child. It's in their child's name. Their child meets the asset and income test. Um, they're a key worker. They could they. They could benefit that way, and we'd also benefit by having additional people living in the city. Yeah. 
Um, Lord Mayor, is it? Sorry, it was Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased that the Mayor's testing is coming, particularly uh, after the uh, result of the last time when we had um, uh, some some that were outliers. Um, the perhaps in terms of the um, criteria. Uh, is there ability for us to, uh, rather than make it essential, just find that criteria up, oh, my apologies, um, rather than actually saying that uh, applicants are eligible if they satisfy all of the following criteria, uh, we could say that preference will be given to key city workers and then you have the eligible criteria. So they still have to meet the income limit, the asset limit, the natural person, et cetera, et cetera. So all you're doing is separating the key worker criteria from outsiders criteria, but you're still preferencing it. Is there ability to do that? Is there ability to do that within the guidelines? You're an expert, so why don't we just think here? It's being I don't want to ruin the email. So that was the question, sorry. Um, through so, the chair. So um, through the chair, um, I think it would be difficult to have a preference of the key city worker. Um, we could certainly have the, um, it not being a requirement, you just didn't meet the income and the asset test and we could uh, market to that segment. Yep. So we're more likely to get them. But um, when you look at our modelling, we've got sort of, you know, a number of scenarios and we, we don't have a cap on what, what we would, um, uh, when we would limit it or when we would stop it. So we don't sort of have a numbers cap or a, or a rate amount cap. That would mean that that preference would mean, um, make much difference. Okay. And my second question is that the income assessment um, the 170,000 for couples and families different to the current um, income assessment criteria. So can you just explain how you got to the 170? I think it's much fairer, but could you just actually explain how you got to that? Through the chair, um, it could help me. We, we did look initially at the um, state government policy SA couples eligibility criteria and singles criteria, um, as uh, you may have seen in, in the attachments. Uh, sorry, links. Uh, the couples criteria under the state government scheme is 110,000 uh, income and 616,000 for assets. Um, and we just felt that that was perhaps a little low and a bit restrictive in terms of who might be able to apply um, and it be eligible. Uh, that's why we went with the dou doubling the single criteria because you may have two key city workers for a couple and that seemed like an option that, that we'll call them this way rather than those with eligible. Thank you. Why could see the one? Why prison guards? Where is our prison? We have one. We have one in the city. We have a detention in the West End. In the West End, we have a prison. Yeah, but they're not called prison guards. They would be prison guards. Yes. Um, Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, like Councillor Moran and 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 others, not all, but and others, I I I'm quite comfortable with the principle of demand stimulus uh, and the council using its very positive cash flow to leverage either bringing forward future demand to the present or bringing in from the suburbs demand to the city. What it strikes me though, we're talking about uh, the rates that would accrue, uh, would be due over a five year period. It amounts to what, five, six thousand, Dollars thereabouts. I know, I know you've got it dutifully uh, documented in the, in the paper. It strikes me that the, a, a two bedroom apartment in the CBD is competing uncompetitively with a two bedroom apartment in metropolitan Adelaide. We have the biggest obstacle, I believe, um, is affordability of a deposit in order to get into the city because the purchase prices are higher. I would be quite comfortable with an examination of what the, the effect of bundling the equivalent value of the rate incentive 
is and making it as a grant up front uh, to stimulate because it's actually the affordability gap for the deposit that is the biggest hindrance to people on relatively speaking lower incomes than those on relatively speaking higher incomes. Oh, so yeah. through, oh. Um, before um, handing to Michelle, thank you, Chair. There were some challenges in the past regarding residential owner occupier grants. Um, which were um, established many years ago to um, certainly um, offset the price of property in the city for the ratepayer. But Michelle, if you're able to just go into a bit more detail about whether um, that's possible. Um, so, so I wasn't aware of that um, through the chair. Um, I was just going to make a comment about that. Um, uh, by, by having something upfront like that, it makes it um, particularly difficult in terms of some of the issues that Council Moran has raised around the longevity of people within the city. You are, in a, in a, in a sense, pop, pushing up the price by that gap um, as well. Um, but we are quite well aware of the challenges in city living is that it's competing with those inner city suburbs and those mid city suburbs, and, and the price, you know, that price point can get you some more, more land. Um, through you, through your chair, if I, if I might just follow up to that, and, and thank you, Michelle. I, I appreciate what you're saying. We are we're, we're in a marketplace that is metropolitan wide, we're statewide, but we, that is a metropolitan wide. And what we're trying to do is increase the supply of housing in in a certain price point, and. If one of the impediments to stimulating further demand is in fact the, uh, the a deposit gap, then is that not something that our stimulus might be better aimed at? I absolutely understand the point that Michelle's making through your chair that um, artificial stimulus to in, in a marketplace can have the, the unintended consequence of driving up the price mm -hmm. because of the gap between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. But we, we have a sector uh, that, apart from what's in the pipeline already approved through, um, through our DAC or, th or through SCAP, um, uh, is going to flatline. Uh, and I know that this is something that is very much uh, on the minds of the members of AIDA who, who have property industry uh, experience and, and expertise. And, it strikes me, therefore, that incentivising upfront, at the end of the day, once the apartment is built, people will come and people will go, and the marketplace will determine what the purchase price is after, after initial establishment. But what we, what, what we need to do is have more supply of housing, build it, and they will come. I, I think that's my fundamental uh, observation. Michelle, um, so through the chair, I think um, that the, the request of the state government around the stamp duty really speaks to part of that as well, oh, in yes. terms of um, that upfront cost that people are having to say for a deposit, but then in addition to that, their stamp duty, which can be a, a, you know, quite large, um, you know, more than what we're, we're looking at in terms of rate rebates as well. So that in some way goes to that issue. Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Jeff, um, and through you. Uh, I know that the initial decision of council was specifically uh, looking at new and off the plan apartments, but noting through all of this conversation that we are looking at a very specific demographic that is going to tend to have limited uh, funds given the lower um, salary brackets. Mm -hmm. Has any work been done either by the City of Adelaide or anywhere else that you're aware of whereby that incentive has been looked at for all properties, be they new or existing? given our, what we're focusing on here is more around attracting people into the city. We're not trying to assist developers to sell off their apartments. We're looking at attracting people and building up the city population as the first and foremost principle of this policy. So through the chair, we did have some um, very high level discussion around what the principles would be. And I suppose a secondary driver was actually around um, our um, increase, increasing our residential supply within the city um, as well. So increase the supply um, uh, for the whole, the whole market. So we haven't specifically looked at 
it um, being offered to the sale of any apartments that are currently built or um, dwellings, or new or dwellings, or dwellings um, that are within that price point. Or any awareness of other cities that have done that, any any evidence around that to suggest whether or not there's any benefit in just driving demand up in general? Uh, yes, Tom? Sure you chaired, just in response to Councillor Donaldson's questions, Melbourne introduced a, a very good scheme in regards to stamp duty where the, the, the city or the state actually reduced the stamp duty. This, this scheme that's proposed tonight is on new build, it's to attract new residents to the city, that's the important factor, so it's actually talked to our growth targets, but um, importantly it will only be successful if we partner with the state government. So there has to be an attraction to to the builder, but there certainly has to be an attraction to the potential buyer, and that's why we need that two-pronged attack. But Melbourne have tackled this quite successfully, but they tackle it through stamp duty. Thank you. And through you, Chair, just noting, of course, there's no way of us telling if someone buys new off the plan whether or not they're new to the city. So similarly, if they were to buy an existing dwelling, we don't know if they're new to the city. So if we had a way of driving demand up in general, I'm just curious as to whether there's any evidence around that. Yeah, I'm through the chair. We actually had a really very robust internal discussion about that, actually, um, because there was a discussion, well, we should be new residents. And then it was like, well, wait a minute, what if people, a lot of people rent first mm -hmm. and then they buy. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've specifically um, made it, it doesn't matter whether they're currently living in the city um, or whether you're not living in the city, you're coming to the city. Um, you can see the results um, in that previous um, scheme that, you know, there were people who were already in the city, probably renters, um, as well as those predominantly the next group were around that sort of inner ring within that five kilometres. Councillor Hyde? Wasn't going to speak though, but interestingly, <clears throat> look, like I'm not sure how many of you have ever been involved in off the plan apartment sales in our city. I can tell you, I, I, can, I mean, have, have, have you ever spoke to any of those agents like doing, the, doing those work in the front line? I can tell you that council road rebates have never ever been a decision making factor. That people want, I mean, you, you wouldn't buy this apartment just because like you, you're going to have like the council road rebate for five years. Bear, bear, bear in mind, only got like $1,500 roughly per year. All right. So people really like taking it as a gift after they sign the contract, but it would never have been a driving factors for them to entering into the contract. And besides that, I do have problems that like say you have this kind of guidelines that are the key workers in, in, in the city will, will be entitled to apply for this kind of like, kind of like rebates. What about those low income people? What about single moms? What about the others that like really have difficulties to buy in the city and live in the city, really like, I mean, I, I, I make comments to like, I mean, I actually tend to agree with Councillor Moran, with these kind of things, you really benefit to those who know how to play the game, not those people who are in the need of help. All right, thank you. Councillor Hunt? Um, just picking up on that point, I was going to say, so this, this, this going ahead at all is incumbent upon the state government saying they're also going to offer stamp duty relief, which actually goes to Councillor Mackey's point and Councillor Ho's point, is probably the real incentive here. We're hanging our hat on their... Yeah, yeah. Have there been any discussions yet with the state government around that that can be shared? Or... Tom? Through your presiding member, yes, uh, both the, the, the manager director of AIDA and myself and all our colleagues have met with the state government representatives for the past six or so months, uh, working through all the complexities in regards to residential growth. And certainly we're they're bringing together a paper which will talk to what incentives or initiatives that they wish to progress. But the first question they say is, uh, Council, what are you going to do? So there's only a couple of options open to us. And one is rent relief, but you're indeed correct. Stamp duty is a large bulk in regards to getting development going. And, and if you speak to a lot of agents, stamp duty is the impediment. Um, so noting noting the answer to the earlier question, which was which was quite informative around disposable income um, and how much do they spend of it in the city. 
would, would it stand to reason, and, and has there been sort of a, a sliding scale model from the administration done that, um, that suggests uh, if it was put up to 180,000 for couples or 90,000, you know, this is how much extra expenditure we would see, or because if, if the incentive is to have more economic activity in the city from people owning and occupying and living here, then it sort of stands to reason that you would want people with more disposable income at the same time. I realise you're trying to do a dual purpose here by offering affordable housing and that sort of thing, but I'm curious if the modelling of a sort of sliding scale was done. Michelle? Oh, so through the chair, no. We, we haven't looked at what that would be because we did have those parameters around um, uh, low and, and, and medium income as well as key city workers. So we really just looked at um, what it would be with, in those quarter quintiles um, and around disposable income. And just for the purposes of calculating the income, um, uh, through you, Deputy Lord Mayor, is the is the one is the eighty five and the one seventy is that pre super or after super or is it? I'm assuming it's pre tax. Or where do we where do we draw the line? <laughs> I think through the presiding member, just the quickest answer would be is that that's the baseline salary that that's based upon. I don't think we consider superannuation because you don't get that as a payout until you're a certain age. So that's a baseline salary. I just want to clarify. Yeah. So, yeah. And and for the purposes of verifying that income earned, do you do you want to see two previous years tax returns or like how obviously we all hear about job keeper you know businesses coming in at the twenty nine percent or the thirty one percent turn down in revenue so they can get it and then they start sending out more invoices um, and they otherwise wouldn't have been eligible. Could someone who works for themselves as a financial sector administrative person just hold back on sending some of their, you know, invoice fees um, and then slip into the bracket and then slip back out of it? Do we average out previous years? What's the science behind it? Can anyone, can anyone do a dodgy on the so, so through the chair for locally, of course they could. Yeah. Um, when you, when you look at the eligibility criteria, because there is this balance between administrative burden um, and actually the, it being an incentive. So um, criteria, um, one of the criteria is signing a statutory declaration confirming, you know, those elements around the contract price, the income, etc. So of course incomes could, vary, could well vary and people might get a new job in, in between and, and um, go outside of that as well. They'd all be already have been eligible. And just if I can sort of double back round um, uh, to the modelling, I, I only asked the question because I'm assuming there is a, there is a sweet spot somewhere at which um, the incentive, minor as it is relative to the total cost, um, uh, the more money someone earns, the less of an incentive it actually is for them. And so when you're comparing that against how much of their disposable income they're spending in the city, it, it actually, there's a sweet spot at which point we're throwing good money after bad. We're providing an incentive to someone or to a group of people who are not going to move into the city um, uh, because of the, and, and the incentive is no longer effective. And that's really why I wanted to understand where that sweet spot is. Yeah. yeah, through the chair. So we can only look at that really based on, on the learnings from the, the last um, uh, rebate that we gave. Um, and if you look in the post incentive analysis report, which is link three, um, it really it, it talks to um, that the majority of residents, um, you know, 66 percent, said that the incentive was a contributing factor towards their decision to live in the city for the first time. Um, when you actually looked at downsizers and retirees, it said they had a, it was of little consequence. They were also those more likely to be spending a lot more money. So the, the key things were around the price point up to that sort of um, 600,000 as that top level, um, and then also um, around you know, their, their income. So we don't have, you know, we haven't got really detailed studies. I'm also interesting that that millennial market in that middle, they're the least likely to respond as well. So we've got less data around what that means for their decisions. Just one more, uh, just, just for my benefit, we definitely, we had the stamp duty in place last time for the life of the agreement. That was the, that was the, that was the yeah, 
Thank you, members. Thank you for the discussion. If, if I may, sorry, sorry just, just for clarification, we actually did the rate rebate first and then the state government matched it with the stamp duty rebate. So again, uh, which was the point of bringing the motion in, in October yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, so if you go back to the motion, it was actually so that we have something to take yeah. to the table. Thank you. Uh, we go to the next item 5.3, uh, Golden Wattle Parkland. We have Stephen. Saluski, uh, um, I'm going to go straight to questions. Cheers, Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, uh, is um, Peary Street clear work in right now? No, no, no. So you can park there and uh, any other questions? Councillor um, Through you, Chair, I'm just looking for a little bit um, more detail around the consultation. I know not everyone, well, there was no one who objected to it, not everyone who was approached actually gave feedback. Um, but I'm just wondering what, what efforts were made to engage businesses not at street level but above street level who otherwise might benefit from having a parking space there and were they responsive? So through you, Chair, our efforts were on the on the ground floor businesses. So we looked at not just hospitality businesses, but all the um, the ground floor businesses, mainly along Fury Street on both sides, um, up to um, the square and down the other other area as well. So there were law firms and, and accountancy firms in there, um, but we didn't go into um, every um, in terms of upper floor buildings um, or stakeholders. And in terms of efforts, it was a letter drop, and um, our outdoor dining officer also went in and spoke to them as well. Thank you. Any other Councillor Murray? Could you just remind me what the are the two car parks are being lost? What are they? Three, Fifteen minute. Three chair thirty minute. So 30 there's minutes. two thirty minute zones um, being um, removed. Um, uh, they also refer to something different on the uh, on the weekend. I think one of them might be a taxi zone. I can get that information for you. And then there's a loading zone that's being shortened. So it's still one standard loading zone, but it's a bit longer than that. Needs to be at this time, but it's still one part. We've worked out that we'd be losing six. Was there a price on them? Yeah, so um, based on uh, three chair, based on previous um, income from those ticket machines, it's about five and a half thousand dollars per annum per bay. So for the two bays that we're losing, the two half an hour bays. And we're charging the. Councillor Moran, can you please put your microphone? We're charging the uh, operator that. To recompense us, are we? Not as such, not directly, no. So we're charging the operator based on our um, permit fee, um, based on the model that was approved and endorsed to go live this year, which is $1.60 per square metre per annum. Um, it's noted that there's a policy that will need to be developed as part of um, part of the council decision around parklets, um, which will look more at what. So, we, so we'd be out, out of pocket. No, so it just works out through your chair. It works out the overall rate is um, that will charge for the year is fifteen thousand one hundred and eighty. Okay, so we'd be. So it's yeah, it's probably small. Look, I suppose the could, we allowed like to comment now. I suppose the the philosophy here is that the on street parks are to uh, encourage people to come in. Uh, pick up whatever they have to for half an hour. It's also been pointed out as a loading zone and a taxi zone. So these two parks perform functions. Uh, now, if we look at our parks as just ways to raise revenue, which I certainly do not agree, um, then we are selling our car parks and just using these spaces of revenue. So that's quite a shift in our philosophy of what our on-street parking is for. Uh, I'm not saying right or wrongly, but there is a philosophy that we get rid of all um, on-street parking and, force, and cause people to use our parking stations. I don't think we're ready for that. Um, so I'm concerned that we do this, I and mean, I know that's a fallacious argument, you know, do this, why don't you have to do it for everybody? But really, if we do this for this, we are opening uh, a huge can of worms. Are you prepared to give up the accessibility of our city for a different source of income. Because I don't think our parks should be viewed as just income. They should be used 
as accessibility to the city. Now, this does not increase the accessibility of the city, it reduces it. Now, two car parks, you think, who cares about that? But while there are plenty of golden wattles all around the city, um, and if I was them, I'd want my on the street. We said no very strictly to Con Macris when he wanted to put very pretty glass eating, um, Parisian eating buildings in the parking spaces outside the village in um, O'Connell Street for that very reason, that those parts are there for a reason. Um, for the businesses. Now you're removing two valuable car parts and I think it's not two, it'll be a hundred because every business will want to, do, want to have it, that can afford to have it. So I think be very careful before you open that floodgate that you agree with the philosophy that our street parks are for sale and will reduce the number of street parks. If you agree with that, do it. If you don't, think about it. Just respond. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, but what we're, we're trying to do here is the, the essence of the, the council decision that we're dealing with to support the Golden Waddles request um, as a bit of a test case. Yeah. Uh, so what we will do is um, review the guidelines and policy decision where a lot of the information that you're talking about in terms of what are the appropriate locations and what conditions would it make sense for a park club will need to be considered um, and that will be brought back into in the council. We haven't had a lot of luck with that. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. Councillor Hunt. Um, <clears throat> I take all those points that Councillor Moran and I very much agree with. Them. Um, that's why I, I just want to go back to the consultation again. Um, sorry to get fixated on these things. Is there is there a policy that I'm assuming there is a policy that guides how we do it? Um, and if so, what are, are there minimum standards in how you undertake that consultation? Um, is it just that I'd, every time you change on street parking controls, I know there's there's some something around there. Was it did you merely just drop that um, framework into this, or what was? How did you go about doing what you do? And did um, are we going to? And this is what I want to get at. If if you're going to use this as a test case, um, you, you really need to set some ground rules for. Uh, a threshold. If, if X amount of percentage of businesses in the vicinity disagree, then we probably shouldn't mm -hmm. proceed with this change in parking controls, um, or should have another way of doing it. Do we have? Do we have that yet? So thank you, uh, through you, Chair. So um, we're not legally obliged to consult around changing parking, but we certainly do as part of our policy, which is absolutely good practice. Um, so in this instance, I don't think we would usually go into businesses and literally speak to them as part of our um, framework. So that was what we thought really important for this because it is um, a, hot, a hot topic. Um, when it comes time, uh, when we do consult, I should say, there's not a fixed number in terms of whether X amount of people support or don't support the parking change because some of it's based on um, the reasons and then things like that. So there's not a hard number in terms of this many say yes and, and we'll do it. Um, but I would expect and absolutely plan as part of when we come back to talk about the, that broader position of guidelines, we'd be looking to discuss some of that in terms of what is appropriate based on the feedback we get. But yeah, I, I, if you're looking for a number in terms of how many um, need to say no before we wouldn't go ahead, that doesn't exist. We, we base on the feedback we get. And, and for the purposes through chair of engaging the businesses vertically, um, they're the ones that aren't at street level. They don't get to see and enjoy the structure. And, and it is look, it's 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 a nice it's a nice structure for the issues there. But um, uh, how how would the administration go about engaging those businesses and getting an answer out of them? So through you, Chair. Um, based on the nature of the parking change, we have in the past gone and done um, letter drops to entire um, residential um, uh, apartment complexes and things like that. Um, traditionally, we don't get a large amount of feedback when we send a lot of um, results, a lot of uh, letters out, but we have got the ability to do that. Um, and we base, depending on what the changes are, I guess, on street and how significant it is for the impact. Mm. Well, I, just, I suppose by, by means of um, feedback, look, I'm broadly happy with this, and I'd really like to thank the administration for pulling it um, uh, together. I think it's, I think it's really good. Um, but for the purposes of having a test case that can inform us going down the track, um, I'd really like to see a, a better 
um, fleshing out of how you engage those businesses that you haven't yet engaged. And I know they'll probably never respond. And we generally only hear from people once something's gone wrong. Um, and that's just how it goes, unfortunately. The trust team's very well versed in dealing with that. Um, uh, but I, I, yeah, I think we, we need some better, we need a more thorough consultative consultation framework for when we do these projects to make sure we mitigate against any of those issues. That would be that would be my feedback. I think having engaged 17 people, three of them said actively that they're happy, the remainder didn't respond. I think we're, we're safe with this one. Yeah, it does create that hazard around um, at what point do we not proceed with one? If everyone else is getting one, um, what is our threshold for? We'll say no, we're not going to issue one here. Um, just one, one very final question. Um, the new bike parking that's being provided by the council, is that um, looking at looking at the drawing, there's sort of some white underneath that. Is that um, is that like concrete that we're putting down and having it flush with the curb, or is that actually part of the fixed structure? Because um, it just it says by council, so I just want to understand the nature of that a little bit there. And and furthermore, I'm I'm guessing that that space that those bikes that the bike parking is occupying if you looked at reconfiguring it it's not going to allow you to lose one less car park is it through you chair certainly yeah, in our conversations and the conversations with the proponent have been very constructive uh, and they're ongoing as part of the development application and assessment so there'll be certainly no more parks lost than what's already um, been discussed uh, in terms of the configuration of what um, what design that is i'll need to um, come back to you on that i don't actually have the detail of what's um, what, what's making up that, that bike parking so i can come back to you on that yeah, and, and just finally, regarding the loading zones, are there any other loading zones in proximity, at, at least on that side of, of Curry Street? Because, I mean, look, looking at it, I don't see why you couldn't just move the whole thing along, ditch the bike parking, and then you'd have to get rid of one less 30 minute car park. It doesn't change the number of car parks, it just makes it a bit shorter. Yeah, there's only one loading zone and there's no fewer loading zones in the new design. Yeah, you could fit another car park. No, you can't. Stephen, would you like to answer that? So there's certainly Before certain standards. There's certain standards we need to adhere to in terms of the size of um, parking spaces. There are other loading zones in Peary Street. Um, how close they are and how um, convenient they are would be a subjective matter. Um, yeah, so, so, so that is uh, that is uh, something. But um, yeah, in terms of. I, I don't I didn't catch Councillor Donovan's, um, Donovan's point on that in terms of um, we can make it shorter without re re uh, losing a, a whole loading zone. If that's what you're, you're asking, and there are others in the vicinity. No, I, sort of the, the question was around, and I realise you're working with them and, and their, their configuration and their business. The question was around um, uh, why couldn't we just move everything down a little bit if there is if there are more loading zones in the area that we think satisfy the demand for that, um, and it really depends on where they are. Obviously, um, uh, why it would it would be my preference if there is if there are plenty of loading zones and we don't think they're occupied at capacity, it would be my preference to remove one of them and keep a thirty minute car park because that's more so for visitors and businesses. So when we were looking at it in terms of our assessment of the impact on parking, we certainly didn't want to lose the loading zone mm. uh, whatsoever because that is um, well used in terms of our it understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that was part of the reason of designing it like this. We didn't want to lose that and we knew that we could um, build, well, support building the park <coughs> whilst we maintain that loading zone there, which is what we want. And there are other short-term parks available the well. Yeah, and if I could just get the detail on what other loading zones are around um, before, yeah. before council. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, I'll just make a plug if perhaps uh, Councillor Hyde would like to download the Smart Parking Adelaide app, you will be able it's to see buggy. with live <laughs> live data right here, right now, exactly which zones um, that are on the, ball, uh, on the street through that area. Thank you. Um, Councillor Just a couple of quick questions. Uh, one, obviously these are 30 minute car parks, so certainly the, the golden bottle isn't somebody who's just going to quickly uh, pop in and have a quick drink. It's there for other businesses, so the question there is, um, if the other car parks around there are, are a longer time, 
so that if that's going to in, in, uh, impact on a, in a business that has a 30 minute turnaround, are we going to um, you know, have something in close proximity that will still have the 30 minutes that will make it available? So through you, Chair. So there are other short-term parking available along Peary Street. Um, there, there may be, what we need to do is investigate as part of this hour what the feedback is once, if it gets approved, what actually happens once it's in place. The reason we went out and talked to those businesses nearby um, was not just to ask if they support a parklet, it was to ask if they're happy and comfortable with the impact on parking, which um, all of them, um, they either verbally um, responded that they didn't have an issue, um, either got back positively, um, and one of them said they'd also like a parklet. So. That's what, that's what support we got. Councillor Donovan? Just out of curiosity, do we have any metrics on uh, as we increase outdoor dining capacity in whatever format, be it parklet or um, our usual on street dining, what uh, impact that has on street vibrancy as measured by? whatever metrics you may choose, be it pedestrian activity, spend, do we have any metrics on that? Uh, fantastic question. I'd, I'd have to get back to you. I don't certainly have them on, I have them on me now, um, but I imagine we would have things in place in terms of economic spend and, and pedestrian numbers, but I don't have them on me now, which is clear. No, that's spot on. Yeah, okay. Sorry, we have item number 5.4, the um, AIDA Advisory Committee. In terms of reference, we have uh, Ian here with us tonight. And I think, Ian, you want to introduce this item? Um, thank you, Chair. We've got Carol Johns with me as well, being part of the process of developing the uh, AIDA Advisory Committee. Um, under our charter, we're required to develop uh, an advisory committee with some terms of reference to bring back to you. Um, we did a workshop that the other week. Um, I recognise that the number of people went out to make the workshop, so I happy to take some questions today. But in quick summary, um, we we used um, Kylie Ferguson to do some external um, consultation for us and help co-create um, the terms of reference for the advisory committee. Um, I think the feedback from that uh, consultation was very clear, simple, consistent. Um, no, no sort of big sort of outliers from our perspective. Um, and if we are to proceed, and the next steps for us would be to bring uh, the report into council on the 13th of July. We would look at putting out expressions of interest um, from about the 26th of July open for about three weeks to give people a little bit of opportunity to apply. Um, there is an assessment panel process which is outlined in the terms of reference. Um, and then subject to to the number of nominations we would get. And I would be expecting a pretty healthy response, to be honest. We had 194 people apply for the board of ADA, um, recently advertised or a reasonably senior role of ADA and had over 60 applications. So there's some appetite out there, I think, to contribute, which would be, to be awesome. Um, the assessment panel would meet um, and then make a recommendation back to the board of ADA um, by the 21st of September. So we'd like to obviously get a bit of a wriggle on and, and fill this position. Um, it's a great two-way communication piece, I think, between particularly the, um, the SME part and the S of the SME part of um, City of Adelaide businesses. So that's a very quick summary. Um, um, both Carol and myself are happy to take some questions if you have any. Any questions? Um, looking at the, the makeup of the of the, uh, the advisory committee, um, and uh, if we're looking at uh, how uh, with AIDA and, and its uh, communications, etc., with, with uh, the whole of the city and all the stakeholders, so given that this is you know uh, very much around uh, people with various skill sets that they're trying to do, uh, certainly covering a variety of, of uh, um, you know, areas in the, within the city, how are we going to uh, how are we going to work around that in the sense of the networking with uh, all of the stakeholders is obviously if this is not going to be a, a, a part of that mechanism in the sense of it is an advisory board around issues. Um, so how do we engage with all the wider community, wider the business community and all the others that will all need to work together? Through the chair, thank you for the question. Councillor, I know you had a, a really strong interest in um, this advisory committee and, and the people that will participate um, via it. 
I think that some of that will be reflected in the advisory committee participants themselves. I think you'll find there'll be some that bring a broad church or a broad network with them as a representative of, of uh, on the advisory committee. Um, we've got significant, um, significant um, distribution channels ourselves. There's databases of 7,000 businesses through our newsletters. Um, we obviously use professional networks like LinkedIn very regularly. Um, the precinct groups themselves that work both ways. Uh, we had an excellent forum with the precinct groups um, just about a month ago. Uh, we had a working working group with every president and a coordinator and another representative and we had an excellent turnout. So I, I think there's just strong levels of engagement. So multiple touch points is probably the answer. Some will be digital, some will be online, some will be through um, distribution channels like the Adelaide Business Collective or the precinct groups themselves or, or other bodies that may end up being um, on the advisory committee. Do you have questions? Councillor Hyde? Oh, Councillor Hyde? Have, uh, yeah. have you got any idea that like, when will the application open? Uh, yes, through the chair, sorry, Councillor. So, uh, I think I mentioned it before, we'll be looking at opening um, Monday, 26th of July, all things being in. Councillor Hyde? Thank you, On what basis, um, through you, Chair, are the are the applicants being assessed? Sorry. Thank you. Through the chair. Within the draft terms of reference, councillor, we have put in that the representatives would be um, the criteria city based have extensive networks within their sector, be strategic yep. focused, focused, et cetera. So it's being assessing against that criteria. Yep. If you applied, okay, you're um, a member of a precinct group or a business on the street, are you city-based? Um, do you have networks? Are you linked in to other groups around so that you can be representative, not just yourself, but a broad church through? It's trying to make it as broad as possible so that we don't limit that you have to be a high income earner or a multi business <coughs> franchisee or etc. Through. I suppose um, uh, I'll just make a, well actually no, I'll follow up question. So who will who will pick the board will pick the managing director will pick the. Yeah. So through the chair, there's a subcommittee of the board, which would be the chair of the Ada board and another representative from the board, and then um, the CR of the City of Adelaide or the delegate. Now I'll make a point. Um, I think when look, we're thinking about thinking about thinking about advising <coughs> and what the advisory committee, the purpose of it. Um, uh, in this role, I take advice of First and foremost, from my ratepayers. Now, uh, I don't get to pick who my ratepayers and voters are. I wish I could sometimes, uh, but I have to take their advice anyway. And that's sort of what I was envisaging um, for the advisory committee to be: is the businesses in the city get to have a say in who goes on there. Um, uh, I absolutely appreciate that Aida will have a think about their purposes, um, the market, uh, what the trends are. Um, and where perhaps they want to beef up some of their knowledge um, uh, and, a, and a second pair of eyes to go over their work. Um, uh, and I have faith that they'll make the right decisions according to that um, and on that basis. But um, part of introducing a citywide business model, um, I think, was the uh, democratisation, I suppose, of, of our engagement um, with particularly the small businesses within the city to make sure we're servicing their needs. Um, and to me, the advisory committee was meant to serve that purpose. Obviously, our precinct groups, um, uh, even though dedicated volunteers as they are, don't necessarily serve that purpose. Um, uh, just by virtue of the volunteer nature of it um, and the fact that they have to um, engage people on their street, and that doesn't always happen. Um, so that's why I appreciate that we've consulted with all the businesses and what have you. Um, having AIDA pick their own advisory committee wasn't necessarily um, exactly where it was going, um, but I appreciate the work. Less. Thank you. 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 Thank
I'm through the chair, I appreciate it. it's a necessary question, but just a, a clarifying comment maybe. Um, if you look at the criteria around small businesses, um, I have a business in the CBD, have extensive networks, these solutions are in tow, and some just some qualifications relevant to their sector or services. We still think we're going to capture a really broad church in that, um, and we also think that it's an assessment against some criteria. So I'm not sure selecting them is quite the right way. I think we're assessing them against some criteria, and that will filter through, and we'll end up with, again, I, I think, um, some really high quality people on the advisory committee. Um, there's also a role there, a very specific role there for um, precinct groups. So we've actually got a nominated precinct group for them to select uh, amongst themselves who they should think should be on the advisory committee. And I think that's probably a good check and balance too for some of the more of that grassroots type representation that you may be referring to. And on that, um, given there's no formalised structure to engage with them, what if they don't agree with who their representative is? Um, uh, through the chair, um, it's a good question. Um, but they've been part of the process of where we've got to tonight. Um, and I think that that'll be uh, based on the, on the feedback we've had from the precinct groups, based on that form, the, the forum we had only a month ago, there's a lot of appetite to, to engage. Um, and I think they're all um, got their own articles of association and their own independent bodies. And this will probably be a good litmus test for them about how they want to um, coordinate themselves and put forward a preferred candidate. Um, regarding remuneration, do you feel that you'll still be able to attract the high quality of people that we'd like to if we're not, if there's no fee for their service, they're business people, they're busy people, so? Uh, through the chair, um, simple answer is yes. Um, the, the nominated person from the advisory that goes on the board will be remunerated, consistent with um, other board members, but the members of the advisory committee per se will not, just to be clear. Thank you. Councillor Mackey, did you have a question? Did you have your hand up before? No? Um, anyone else? We're all good. Thank you. Um, we're going to next item 5.5, um, the event in Barnathan Park. I'm just going to make a joke. So we go <laughs> do, do you want to speak to this at all? No, do we have any questions about Magic Mike show? No, there's no video presentation. No. Sorry. Damn. No, there's no photos, no nothing. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Through, through you, and I guess it's a rhetorical question. Um, how would the administration, how would we, a hypothetical question, feel if it were Magic Michelle and not Magic Mike? Um, so we'd let strippers in and, and accept the, the community sentiment about female strippers as being the same as male strippers. It's a quick, it, it's a, it's a hyper, it, it is a rhetorical Are you, are you directing question. this to administration to answer oh, or are you directing this for me I'm to not, answer? Or are you, chair, I'm, I'm, <laughs> do you want to take I'm, it out just, and consult on that? <laughs> Chair, I, 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 I'm simply making a point. Like, you know, I'm a live and let live kind of guy, so it is a, it's a rhetorical question. But um, it's, it is interesting that our community standards with regard to male strippers have somewhat um, uh, evolved differently to our attitude to female strippers. Maybe we can put a recommendation for it with the Magic Mike and Michelle show. I don't know. So, um, any other questions? Any other discussion in regards to this? No, thank you. Okay, next item, 5.6. Uh, we uh, we reimagine Adelaide New Year's Eve. Would you like to speak to that? Thank you. Thank you, members. Hello. The, um, the countdown is on again. <laughs> for New Year's Eve, and this report outlines a new approach to New Year's Eve. Um, it provides opportunity for families, for people who want to party, and for sophisticated revel. Um, the three elements to the city's New Year's Eve celebrations include a family event um, with a hybrid pyrotechnic show, midnight moments involving bespoke pockets of activation across the city, appealing to a range of demographics and supporting local business, and outdoor expanded on-street dining opportunities. So all three elements will include a hybrid and visual um, pyrotechnic show. 
Um, McGregor Tan have undertaken comprehensive research and engagement with industry, which has assisted with the approach to provide a range of opportunities for these different markets. It's also clear from the research that fireworks are considered a traditional part of New Year's Eve celebrations. So we're happy to present this to you and take your questions. Thank you, Lord Mayor. So uh, just given the reporting uh, that has happened on it just in the last uh, day or so, can we just clarify fireworks? Because it was reported that, of course, we're getting rid of all fireworks in the City of Adelaide for New Year's Eve. So for the record, can we clarify what's happening with fireworks? Uh, through the chair, we are still proposing to have fireworks and some form of light laser show, so very much a hybrid model um, towards celebrating and bringing in the New Year's. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hyde? Um, who said that we couldn't have fireworks at 12? Was that discussed with SA Health and SAPOL? Or or that was purely our decision without their advice or sorry fireworks at midnight yeah is that the question yeah yeah there's fireworks at nine o'clock and there's fireworks at midnight oh wait so you are having fireworks oh, yes sorry, we are having yeah. fireworks okay so well, hence i was trying to clarify the okay, fireworks, fireworks question fireworks. because it's been reported that we are not having fireworks where it's very clear in the report also, that we are. It's very clearly stated in the report that we have fireworks at 9pm and at midnight. And at midnight. And are we scaling them back at all? Uh, through the presiding member, the plan is to scale the fireworks back slightly compared to what we've seen in the previous years to respond to a previous um, decision of council to investigate a hybrid model. So that's why this year we're proposing to do exactly that, have fireworks and laser light. So it won't be the full budget spent on fireworks, it will be that hybrid approach. Mm. You get an apology for that. Yeah, I know. Um, from the newspaper. Not from you. Not from, from, you. Uh, from the newspapers reported it incorrectly. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions in regards to the reimagined New Year's Eve? And I believe that this is going to be spread throughout the whole city. Um, and um, it looks like it looks great. Oh, can oh, I, no, I, just, I just wanted to reiterate that this is this is fantastic. Yeah. And this provides a model for us going forward. I think if if we can actually make this quite successful this year. Um, it really means that you're actually getting a lot of bang for your buck. Um, putting on an event for 60,000 people, that was, sorry, um, putting an event on for 60,000 people that come into the city and bring their sort of packed in with their kids, that's lovely and all, we should continue to do that. But if we can bring more people in to spend money, then it provides much greater justification for spending more money on the event to then get greater returns for our businesses and to bring people in to come and celebrate. So I hope that's, I hope this is um, assessed in that light. Are we, do we have, do we have anything after the fact? I mean, we're not gonna be doing exit surveys on the people that come in to party because maybe they won't remember it, but how are we going to be capturing um, uh, and, and assessing, you know, how many people come in and, and what they do and how much they spend? Um, through the presiding member, yes, we will be undertaking um, research following the event. Um, some of that will include um, surveying people who are participating, also engagement piece with the businesses who participate, and all of that data um, that we collect and analyse will then help inform what the following year is. So there certainly will be that research piece undertaken. Thank you. Thank you. I'll oh, we'll just go to the next item. I think we're sealing that one as well, 5.7. Um, is that correct? Um, the place of courage location. Uh, I think we'll take that as read. Um, it's all in your papers, the, the site that um, has been identified. Does anyone have any questions in regards to it? All pretty straightforward. That's great. Next item, 5.8. Um, we have Ian Hill back again to uh, talk about the 2021-22 uh, Events and Festival Sponsorship Program funding recommendation. No? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, thank you. Excellent. Do you have any questions, Councillor Hyde? Did you have a question? 
Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if we could be walked through, obviously, this is the last part of a three year arrangement um, for them. And like, we only really have to do it because we're we do an annual business plan budget each year. Um, is is there any work underway? Um, and could we be informed as to that work and where it's at regarding the nature of the sponsorship, um, whether we're getting a return on investment for the sponsorship, um, sort of that contestability work and how that's looking? Uh, through the chair, thank you for that, Councillor Hyde. Um, at, during the next 12 months, all of this last and final year is, um, um, rolls out, we will then look to review the program in its entirety and particularly looking at that return on investment, looking at cost versus benefit analysis of the sponsorship to ensure that the City of Adelaide is getting value for money across our sponsorship um, with the current events. Mm. Um, and I suppose this actually follows on from my last question about New Year's Eve. Um, were, there, were there, at the start of these three year funding um, deals, was, were there arrangements put in place to actually uh, track and see whether the, the three year deals are actually generating more benefit um, uh, for us and for them? Um, and if so, have we, have we met the standard that we thought we would achieve by um, guaranteeing the funding? How does that, how does that look? Uh, through the channel. Um, actually, with each event that we sponsor through the agreement process, we also have an acquittals process where events are required to return back to us an overview of the event and then also the, um, an economic analysis of the return on um, our investment with that event. Uh, and so looking at that economic analysis or the analyses, um, do we, do we feel that these are working at the moment um, and that's factoring into our decision making going forward? Have they performed better than we expected or worse than we expected um, or about the same as if we were just giving them uh, a year and a half? Um, through the chair, it's a really interesting question. So um, I think constant uh, re-evaluation of this sort of expansion could be significant. It's about $1.8 million that goes from um, great pays into these major events. I think it'll be really mindful here too that the event industry has been absolutely smashed by COVID. So it's been a really challenging 18 months for anyone in the event um, business, whether you're global, national or local. I think South Australia has been incredibly fortunate. Um, uh, events like the Freedom Store still able to be held or even smaller events held down the East End. And in some ways we're the envy of the world to be able to do some of these things. So I don't think we'd have the expectation of necessarily the same economic return when you don't have international flights, so you've got domestic flights and diminished or borders just being shut hard with three days notice. Mm -hmm. So I think we've certainly given some, some leeway around that as we should, um, because of these things that are totally outside of control of the event organiser. But the principle around a bit more consistency of reporting, um, being a bit clearer about the benefits that we're trying to attract. Um, um, so there's things that are fairly stock standard in the event sector, but we'll be a bit more sophisticated than that moving forward the next round of um, three year funding agreements. I, I would also reiterate that the three year funding agreements for the bigger events certainly enables them to plan better, uh, which is an important principle from their perspective. Mm -hmm. and, just, and just finally, as part of that acquittals process, is with the economic impact, um, is there much given to, is there much weight given to the cultural importance of um, uh, of these events how do you it's one thing to look at dollars spent and that sort of thing and i realize it's a very vague question that i'm asking but they are you know instead of looking at the festival ideas um feast festival fringe womad food cabaret um how do we how do we wait and, uh, and 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 judge how successful they are in that realm where you haven't got sort of very easy indicators of dollars spent in hotel bed nights and that sort of thing. Um, for the chair, another question. Um, it's not easy to measure the vibe mm. sometimes, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I think we certainly look for the contribution they make to our strategic plan across the city of Adelaide, which talks about vibrancy in surprising places. And so we put a little bit of extra emphasis on how they will respond to that to us. So it is clear that that's what we are looking for is, um, 
sometimes secondary outcomes, sometimes primary outcomes. So uh, the bed nights is one piece, and, and certainly organisations like the South Australian Tourism Commission use that sort of data heavily. Mm -hmm. I think we've got a slightly broader remit than that for getting the city activated and moving. And I'm, I'm very conscious that a number of elected members have also talked about how the, there are secondary spin-offs to local businesses. So we're certainly doing a bit of specific work at the moment around um, what a toolkit for you know, broader church businesses and CBD can leverage off um, some of these larger events. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Councillor Sorry, just wanted to ask that uh, I couldn't see the, the Casa Strip parties on the list, whether or not it's actually coming from the other the other the other funds. Through the chair, um, a decision was made back in 2000. And, sorry, I just checked my notes. 2021, mm -hmm. in the way that we fund those multicultural events that are essentially run by volunteers. Mm -hmm. So we, the sponsorship program, transferred funds over to the community development grants program. And so last year, Lunar New Year, Glendy Indofest all applied the funding through that program and I understand that that program was recently reviewed so when that opens again which I'm imagining will be in the next couple of months then those events will be able to apply. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next item 5.9 the heritage listed property insurance. We have no, we don't. <laughs> Sorry, I have grace in my notes. So. Hi. Thank you. Sorry, apologies for that. Um, any, uh, I'll take the papers spread in regards to this one. Any questions? Councillor Hyde. Um, this, this may not have um, rest in your area, so apologies, but a number of years ago now, it's funny saying that, a couple of years ago I moved a motion regarding heritage rate rebate um, and I see, I know that was included in, in, in the action strategy as a possible action item. Was the, the information here on, on that's, that's been provided regarding a potential rebate is that essentially reflective of what's in the heritage strategy? I think it is. Um, through the chair, um, I'm not privy to exactly what was in the heritage strategy, um, but I know um, I believe this was originally intended to be included in that. I believe it got withdrawn uh, later on to be submitted as a separate item in the like so. Right. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Um, item 5.10, we have the strategic plan 2020-2024 year one update. We have Matthew here to present. Um, do you want to introduce this item at all, Matthew? Thank you. Um, through the chair, I just wanted to really highlight that this report um, really brings together the, the collective and significant contribution um, over the past 12 months in progressing those 49 key actions within our strategic plan. Um, this report brings together an update across all of the administration on those key actions um, in alignment with what we set out to achieve um, at the adoption of our strategic plan back in March 2020. Um, I think it's a, a really good representation of the resilience and um, contribution that the City of Adelaide has displayed in contributing to live up to our vision as the most livable city in the world and something that I think we continue to do now being number three, um, which is quite an achievement. 
And I think acknowledging that together with our community, um, we have managed to achieve a lot and progress those strategic plan outcomes well, um, including to, but obviously not limited to, um, being the first local government administration in South Australia to be carbon neutral certified and delivering our commitment to establish a citywide business model in support of a stronger economy. I think this report highlights um, many achievements that we've achieved in delivering those key actions. Um, and we're really looking forward to those next steps in continuing to market those achievements um, to our community um, and continue to move forward with those strategic plan key, key actions over the next few years. Thank you, Matthew. Any questions? Oh, Councillor Hyde. Um, just on one of the ones, well, first of all, I think I'm missing uh, a not completed. Did we have two not completed? Oh, sorry, not commenced. Sorry. Uh, thank you. There was only one. one. Oh, it's only one. Okay, right. So I'm not missing it. Um, I just just reading that, I would have thought that pursue affordable, reliable links to airports, regions and suburbs. Is the standard for meeting that saying that we're looking at links to all three of those sorts of places or why why don't we consider it not, not commenced? I would have thought the city access strategy um, sort of fulfilled that a little bit. So I'm just, I'm curious, that's all. Is that a question or? Oh yeah, that was a that, that was a question. Why do we think it's not commenced? Because I thought it was commenced. That's right. Uh, thank you. Um, so through the chair, um, we rely on updates across the administration to demonstrate how we've progressed and based on what we have received um, from our colleagues, um, there has been no report against that key action at this point in time. Um, but happy to take that on board and continue that conversation with them. Yeah, I, I would just I would just suggest it. Um, certainly, we've had lots of discussions around public transport. I know Councillor Knowles um, suggested that there have been things such as the city access strategy that there are discussions around as well. So, um, look, pursue is not a very big one, but I, I would personally say that we have pursued it. Um, we're not we're not. Um, uh, the state government, we don't get to choose all the transport routes and, and particularly influence public transport and that sort of thing. Um, but I would definitely um, think that we, it is something we have and are continuing to pursue. Um, so if, I'd be particularly interested if the CEO could investigate whether or not part of the administration actually actively either didn't report or actively did report that we had not commenced that. If so, I'd be really interested to know why they felt that we weren't commencing it and are there things that we could do to commence. Thank you, Acting CEO. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. Um, that's a really good point, uh, Councillor Hyde. Um, the City Access Strategy um, is obviously um, still not com uh, completed in terms of uh, Council having um, endorsed um, anything publicly in relation to that piece of work. Um, when council members developed this action, it really was around, at that time, um, spending a lot more focus on um, having the airport um, have some sort of access um, from the city. And there was lots of um, feedback during some of the workshops um, that the bus that the state government had put on um, was driving around the city with one person and a suitcase on it at that point in time. Um, and so the feedback from council members was to um, put um, a lot more sort of effort into um, trying to work with state government, particularly around addressing that perception. Um, like Matt, I am keen to understand why the team has felt this isn't being prioritised. It could be because of during COVID when we um, had uh, looked at our work plan that we've decided due to the um, little activity happening um, in that area and a big piece of work um, underway at that point, um, particularly from the transport team um, around bikeways, we may just have prioritised some workloads differently. But I'll certainly take your feedback on board and make sure that we have some communication uh, to council members to help us all understand that, yeah, how the team has prioritised it. Thank you. And just um, relevant to previous discussions, of course, we now have in our strategic asset management plan putting in a uh, a principle or a priority on congestion busting, um, which I think really speaks to that uh, uh, point. Just like that for me. 
Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Any other questions? Any other discussion on this matter? No? We're all good. Thank you. Um, item 511, Council Member Elections, Diversity and Gender Equity. We have Mick Kotowski with us. I'm going to take the papers as read. Unless. Sorry? There's just one paper, it's one page. What? So oh, okay. Sorry. Take it. The item as read. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Um, any questions? No, we're all good. We're all happy with that. Thank you, Mick. That was easy. <laughs> yeah, oh, Mick, we've got the next one as well. About 512 review of the Apple Charter. Again, I'm going to take this as read um, and I'm going to open up to any questions or any items of discussion regards to this matter. We're all good? It's all easy tonight. Damn! <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, members, we have two items for exclusion. Um, of the public, um, we have um, item 7.1 and 7.2. 7.1 um, being the Whitmore Square tenancy. Um, I'm going to seek a mover and a seconder to have this item excluded from the public. We have Councillor Donovan, a Councillor Seconder, Councillor Noel, and would you like to speak to it, Councillor Donovan? No. Anyone else would like to speak to it? No, thank you. Take it to a vote. Those in favour? Those against? That the motion is carried. We have the second item for 7.2, Gawler uh, U Park Priority Works. Um, I have a move for that, Councillor Hyde. Seconder, Councillor Null. Anyone like to speak to that? No. Okay, those in favour? Those against? Councillor Hyde, are you voting once? Sorry. Right? Okay, in favour? Okay. Thank you. So, members, uh, okay. We're going to take these um, items into confidence. Anyone that is not associated with any of these items, a 7.1 or 7.2, can you please leave the building and we are going, I mean, leave the room.
Open the door. And in the end. The end.